Hi, I'm Carl. In this workshop, we'll be writing our first term. This workshop is designed to be hands-on, meaning you can follow along and run the commands on your own machine. I highly encourage you to do so and to run and experiment with Juju. Uh, I think you'll get a lot more out of the workshop. We'll start with a brief introduction of Juju and terms, and then we'll dive into the hands-on section of the workshop. For the hands-on section, you'll want to have some software installed. It might take a few minutes to download, so if you run these commands now, hopefully by the time we get to the hands-on section, you'll be ready to go. We've created a GitHub repository for today. The link to that repository is in the chat and the description. The repository contains a readme uh, with these commands, so you can copy and paste directly from the readme. Again, the link to the GitHub repository is in the chat and the description. Throughout the workshop, if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat. My colleagues will be available and are very happy to answer any questions that you have. If while you're running these commands to set up your environment, you run into any issues, again, please ask in the chat and one of my colleagues will be able to assist you. We encourage you to get involved in the Charming community. First, there's Charm Hub, which is a listing or store of charms. You can find charms written by members of our community and staff at Canonical, and you can also publish your own charms to Charm Hub. There's our forum, which is a great place to ask questions, or if you learn something that you'd like to share with other developers, uh, the forum is a great place to do that in an asynchronous format. And finally, there's our chat or Mattermost. It's an instant messaging platform similar to Slack, and you'll find members of our community and engineers at Canonical who are active in the channels and are happy to answer any questions that you have or help troubleshoot any issues that you're running into. If you see a charm on Charm Hub that you're interested in contributing to, the chat is a great place to connect with the developers to discuss your ideas and see how they can support you in making that contribution. Now we'll give a brief overview of how Juju works. If you're interested in learning more about Juju, I encourage you to check out Juju's documentation. If you have questions uh, now, you can ask them in the chat. And if you have questions later, you can ask them on the Mattermost or the forum and someone will be happy to help. So when an operator deploys an application with Juju, they interact with Juju through its command line interface. Uh, the command line interface could be running on their laptop, for example. The command line interface talks to the Juju controller. The Juju controller is the node that manages other nodes in the cloud environment. For example, if we had a Kubernetes cluster that we wanted to deploy applications to, the controller could be running in a node, sorry, in a pod in the Kubernetes cluster and it would be managing and scaling other pods in that Kubernetes cluster. But the controller can also run outside of the cloud it's managing. For example, we could have a controller on a virtual machine that's managing that Kubernetes cluster. Also, a controller isn't limited to a single cloud. So we could have a single controller that manages a Kubernetes cloud, an OpenStack cloud, and a VMware cloud. For today's workshop, we'll be using a single Kubernetes cluster, and the controller will live in the will be in the same cluster as the applications that we're deploying. Uh, one thing to notice with des this design is that Juju provides a consistent interface uh, on the command line across different clouds. And so Juju provides a simple UX for the person deploying applications, and then it translates that to the underlying API calls it needs to make to each individual cloud. Within a cloud, Juju has models uh, you can think of a model like a workspace. It's just a grouping of applications. By application, I'm referring to this box on the right. An application can consist of multiple units. A unit is just the machine that the application is running on. Um, in Kubernetes, the, the unit is a pod. Within that unit, you have the application itself. Uh, for example, for MySQL, that would be the MySQL binary. You have Python code that is operating the application. It's called the term operator, or term for short. And finally, also within the unit is the Juju agent. The Juju controller continually monitors the current state of applications and their desired state. And based on that, sends events to the Juju agent within each, each unit. When the Juju agent receives an event, it executes the term code and passes along information about that event. So what is a term? 
Several organizations and enterprises recognize the value of sharing open source application software. Many of those organizations have similar operational requirements. For example, an organization deploying a database might require that it is highly available. Um, for example, if uh, a machine that the database is running on goes offline, or if an entire cloud region that the database is running on goes offline, they need the read and write traffic to that application to continue. As another example, an uh, organization deploying a database might require regular automatic backups to be taken. The idea with Juju and Terms is to take the idea of sharing this app open source application code one step further and to also share the operational knowledge required to deploy, operate, and manage those applications. The way Juju does this is by taking that knowledge and packaging it into shareable Python code called termed operators or terms. Uh, so what does a term do? A term handles multiple stages of the operational lifecycle. Um, so you have installing, configuring, scaling, and updating the application. After the application is installed, the term defines actions that the, the operator can run. For example, taking or restoring a backup. And finally, the term defines integrations with other terms. For example, Mattermost requires a PostgreSQL database. And so the Mattermost term can define an integration with the Postgres term. What this means is that an operator can type juju deploy Mattermost, juju deploy Postgres, juju integrate Mattermost Postgres. The two term operators talk to each other, share information, and set up a connection between Mattermost and Postgres. There are many existing tools that help manage the lifecycle, so the installing and configuring, for example, Terraform, where Juju shines is in its actions and integrations. So what does Juju look like on Kubernetes? When we run Juju add model, what Juju is doing under the hood is just creating a Kubernetes namespace. So a Juju model maps directly to a Kubernetes namespace. Similarly, a Juju application is just a stateful set in Kubernetes. And then uh, a unit in Juju is just a pod in Kubernetes. And when we scale an application with Juju, it's setting the number of replicas for the Kubernetes stateful set. Juju also supports clouds besides Kubernetes, for example, virtual machines or bare metal. Um, and Juju provides a similar mapping of a Juju concept, like a model or an application, to the underlying cloud primitive that you would expect. This means that operators who are deploying applications with Juju have a consistent user interface across different clouds. Um, and it makes it easier for organizations to, to switch between public cloud providers or to even switch entire substrates um, while maintaining a consistent UX. Not only is it a consistent UX for people deploying applications, but the, the term operator developers, term developers, have a, have a similar UX across cloud substrates. Um, so within a Juju unit on Kubernetes, uh, which again is a pod, we have the workload container and the term container. Uh, you'll notice that the, the workload container and the term container are in the same pod. Uh, this means that as we scale up the application, the term scales with it. This means that the term developer doesn't have to worry about networking or latency or other challenges with distributed systems because the term is always right next to the, to the application that it's operating. This is different from traditional Kubernetes operators where the operator lives in a different pod from the workload that it's operating. The, how, so how does the, the term container and the workload container communicate? Uh, so Juju uses something called Pebble, which is a lightweight service manager. And Juju injects that into the workload container, into the applications container. Um, so you can use an upstream workload container. Uh, and then Juju will inject Pebble, which allows the term to manage this, the services in that container. Uh, and the term communicates with Pebble over a Unix socket. Okay, so now we're going to jump to the hands-on section. Um, again, here are the instructions to set up your environment and to install the software. Uh, they're available in the README of the GitHub repository that we're using today. The link to the GitHub repository is in the chat and the description. Um, if you run into any issues while running these commands, please ask in the chat, and one of my colleagues will be able to help you. Uh, just to quickly run through this, 
Uh, first, we're installing microcrates, which is a lightweight Kubernetes. It lets you run, for example, an entire Kubernetes cluster on your laptop. Then we're installing, then we're enabling uh, a couple add-ons of microcrates for storage and DNS. Then we're installing Charmcraft, which is a build tool for charms. Next, we're installing Juju. Uh, and this make dir command is a, a temporary workaround, so you won't have to run that in the future. And then here, Juju Bootstrap is we're creating the Juju controller. So Juju Bootstrap microcrates says, tells Juju, I want to create a controller in the microcrates cloud. So Juju will spin up a pod with a Juju controller that will manage other pods within that cloud environment when we deploy those other applications. Next, we're adding a model called development. So this is a workspace that we can deploy our applications to. And then we're configuring the, the verbosity of the debug log to be a little bit more verbose than usual. This is helpful for a development environment to see what's happening, uh, but you would want to use a different configuration for a production deployment. Next, we're installing JHack, which is a developer, a Juju developer tool. And then finally, we're cloning the GitHub repository that we're using for today. Um, today, we're creating a charm for Zinc, which is a, a lightweight alternative to uh, OpenSearch or Elasticsearch. Um, and again, you can copy and paste all these commands from the readme and the GitHub repository that's linked in the chat in the description. OK, so switching to the IDE. Um, this is uh, what you should get when you clone the repository. And then um, you want to check out the first tag, 0 init. And so within the, throughout the present, throughout this workshop, um, there will be different points uh, in the Git repository where we have a tag that corresponds to where I am in the, the hands-on demonstration. And so if you get behind or you want to skip ahead, you can just check out the tag that I'm using and your repository will update so that you have the same working environment that I do. Um, so we're starting on the zero init tag. And what this is, is uh, the set of files you get when you run charmcraft init. Um, so for example, if I were to make a new directory and run charmcraft init, this gives me a basic template for a charm. Um, and you can see that the files here are the exact same as what we have here. Uh, so right now, what we have is exactly the same as if you were to run charmcraft init. Um, so if you were to create a, a charm for a different application, you could create a directory and then run charmcraft init. Um, so charmcraft init comes with a lot of batteries included. Uh, so you can see that it comes with uh, predefined integration tests um, and unit tests. And there's also a tox configuration file, which gives us things like automatic formatting and linting of our code. Um, these are really great when you're writing your first term, and I would recommend using them. Uh, for the purpose of this demonstration, we're going to remove most of these files to get the simplest term possible, uh, just to make things a little bit easier to understand. So if you follow along with me and check out the one dash base tag, uh, I just took the termcraft init and I deleted most of the files, and we're left with these three files. Uh, so first we have our termcraft.yaml. Um, which is telling Charmcraft what we want to build the Charm on. So in this case, we want the Charm to run on Ubuntu 22.04. Uh, so this is telling Charmcraft when it's packaging the Charm to upload it to Charm Hub to, to build it on Ubuntu 22. And then we have our metadata file, which defines some information for Charm Hub, like the name of our Charm, a summary, and a description. And this will show up on the Charm Hub store. Uh, and finally, we have the charm itself, um, which, if you take a look, is an executable file. Uh, see, it's executable. And uh, it has a shebang for Python 3. So this is the file that is being executed whenever the GG agent receives an event. Uh, and here, just for this demonstration, we're going to just log a hello KubeCon um, when the charm runs. 
So to pack this term, we can run term craft pack. And the first time you run this command, it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, but then after that, every subsequent pack should be quicker. Uh, if you're curious, what this is doing is it's creating an LXC container. So you can see here, it's creating a LXC container for this project. Uh, and what this allows us to do is like the, the machine I'm running on is an Ubuntu 22.04 machine. And in this case, the, we're building on Ubuntu 22.04, so that's fine. But say I wanted to build the term on Ubuntu 20.04, um, meaning I wanted to run with like Python 3.8 instead of Python 3.10. What would happen when I run Termcraft pack is that the Termcraft would create an LXC container based on Ubuntu 20.04. So it will install my Python packages with Python 3.8. And so this lets you have a separate build environment from the computer that you're working on. And so right now it's just setting up that, that container for the first time and installing some software. Uh, in a few seconds, hopefully it will finish packing. All right, you can see here it's finishing up. Um, and when Charmcraft packs a charm, it creates a .charm file. This .charm file is just a, a regular zip file, but with a specific structure. Um, and so to demonstrate that, we can actually unzip the charm file with a regular tool that we would use uh, for zip files. And if we take a look inside, we have our charm file from before. We have the metadata file. We have a manifest file, which is like some metadata that Charmcraft includes about when it packed it, what version of Charmcraft it packed it with, and like what uh, Ubuntu version it was built with. Uh, and then we have this dispatch script. Uh, so you can write charms using languages other than Python, like bash. Um, and this is from back before uh, the Python terms existed. And so this is a, a backwards compatible way um, so that those old terms and the new Python terms are packaged in the same format. Um, and so what this does is it's not actually the, the charm.py file that's executed by the Juju agent, it's this dispatch file. Uh, but in our case, charmcraft creates a dispatch file which just executes that Python file. So when the Juju agent receives an event, it's running this dispatch script, which then executes the charm.py file. Uh, and you can see here, it's just adding um, some information to the Python path. And other than that, it's uh, just executing the Python file. Uh, and then there's also this hooks folder, which is for backwards compatibility with those older bash terms. And it's just the, the same file as the, the dispatch file. And again, when the Juju agent receives an event, it executes this file, which then executes the, the charm.py file. Um, so let's deploy this charm. Um, so I'm going to split my terminal into a couple different windows. And this will allow us to see, um, see what's happening a little bit better. Uh, so in this window, I'm going to run Juju status. And you can see um, that we're on the development model and that we're on the microcontroller that we just bootstrapped. Um, you should see an output very similar to this when you run uh, Juju status. If you don't see this, please ask in the chat so that one of my colleagues can help you. And then in this window, we're going to run the Juju debug log. Uh, so this will just give the output of the log. Uh, and remember, we set it earlier to be a little bit more verbose. So you can see a little bit more information about what's happening. Uh, and then now we're going to deploy the charm. Um, so if you're deploying a charm from charm hub, instead of saying dot slash sync, you would just say the name of the charm. But since we're deploying a locally built charm, we specify the path instead. Um, and you can see in Juju status, we now have a, a Zinc Kates application. 
Um, and uh, one that deployed one unit of the application. So it's running on one pod. Uh, this is the IP address for that pod. Um, so if we take a look at using cube control, uh, we can see what's actually happening here. So if we get the namespaces, as I mentioned earlier, the Juju models map directly to Kubernetes namespace. So the Juju model development maps to this development Kubernetes namespace. And if we look at the pods in that namespace, we can see one pod for the, the zeroth unit of the Zinc Kates app. Um, and if we look at our Juju debug log, we can see that uh, we deploy the term and then it ran an install event. We got the hello kubecon log. Then it ran a leader elected event. Uh, and we got the log again. And then it ran a config changed event. Uh, and we got the hello kubecon log one more time. Um, and so to give you an idea of what's happening, Juju provides some debug tools. Uh, one of them is called Juju debug hooks. And so what happens in a normal Juju deployment is that when the agent receives an event, it executes this dispatch script. Um, but Juju debug hooks lets us um, debug that execution. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So we can type Juju debug hooks and then the name of the unit that we'd like to debug. Um, and so there's no events firing right now because we installed the application. So I'm going to use jhack, which is a Juju developer tool. And so Juju has Juju has a few different types of events that we won't go into much detail, but you can see like the, the install event, the config changed event, start event. Uh, there's one event called the update status event, which runs by default every five minutes, but the, the amount of time between each of those events can be configured. And so jhack has a tool called jhack fast forward, which all it does is it sets this interval to a few seconds so that we can fire an event on the term, which will let us debug that event. Um, so I'm running jhack fast forward. And you can see that we have this new terminal session. Um, and it, it gives us information. So normally, uh, when Juju receives the event, it would execute the this dispatch script. Um, this is the same dispatch script that was in the .charm file. Um, but when we run Juju debug hooks, what Juju does is it lets us, it puts us in a terminal environment right before that dispatch event is ran. Um, and so the way that Juju tells us what event we're executing, so for example, the way the term knows the difference between an install event versus a config changed event is with environment variables. Uh, so if we take a look at the environment variables, we can see that Juju is setting, um, is giving us certain information. Uh, like you can see, here's our, our unit name. And then one of these variables should tell us the event right here. We're getting an update status event. Um, and so the charm can read information from those environment variables to tell what event is happening. And then if we want, wanted to run the charm like normal, we could do the dot slash dispatch. Um, and you can see here that we get the, the hello kubecon message. And finally, we're going to exit out of this debug session. And we can go back to Juju status. Um, so this is really helpful. Um, but the this is this is not what you would get with Charmcraft init. Um, so Charmcraft init includes something called ops, um, which is like a it it takes the, the Juju environment variables and it gives us a Python API to access it. Um, so instead of our charm code manually having to check the environment to see what event it is, we can use ops, which is just like a, a Python API for Juju to access that information. Ops also does one more thing. So it's both an API for Juju, for the Juju framework, and it's a framework in itself. And so with Juju, 
when our term runs, you have um, the term is executed once per event. So for example, if I were to set like a global variable and I were to increment that counter, um, every time there's a new Juju event, this script executes and then exits. Um, so as we saw before in the log, we got multiple uh, hello kubecon messages, one for each event. And so what happens when Juju runs our term is that when the Juju agent receives an event, it wakes up the term, executes this Python script, exits, and then when the next event comes, it starts the script from the beginning. Um, so if we were to set a counter, every event we receive, the counter would be reset to zero because the script is being executed again. Um, so I mentioned that ops is a Python API for the Juju framework. It's also a framework in itself where um, with Juju, every time your term is executed, you're executing a single event. But with ops, it allows you to have multiple events within that, that single Juju event execution. Um, and it lets you do things like deferring events. Uh, but we'll get more into that later. Uh, so now we're going to we're going to add ops back to our term. Uh, so we're we're going to go more towards the the term craft init template that we started from. Uh, and so. When I'm finished with adding ops, we'll be switching to the uh, two dash ops tag. Um, One moment. Okay, um, so to add ops, we're going to import it. And then we also need to add it to our requirements.txt file. Uh, and then I'm gonna create a virtual environment and install. It looks like there's some issues with the machine I'm using. So I'm just going to remove the application to see if that helps. OK. OK, so we've added ops. And then we're going to add a class for the charm. And so what this is, um, is so I mentioned that ops lets us have multiple events within a single two-digit event execution. And so with ops, uh, what we do is we're creating this charm class, which inherits from a, an ops class. And then we're telling it what events that we want to, to register callbacks to register handlers for. Uh, so this, this line here, self.framework.observe, uh, is saying that when ops sees that Juju is executing the start event, 
we want to run this callback, the on start method. Uh, and then here, we're moving that, that warning here. And then finally, we need to add one more thing, uh, which actually executes the class with ops. Uh, so what we added here is um, when the script is executed, it will run the, it will tell ops to use this, this charm, the callbacks we defined to handle the event from Juju. Um, so in this example, if we were to receive an on install event, um, this class would be initialized, but since there's no observer that registers a callback for the install event, we wouldn't run anything. So we won't see this log warning on the install event. Um, we can go ahead and pack this term, I think. Yeah. And you'll see that this time the packing should be a bit quicker uh, since we've already created that container. And if you haven't already on your machine, you can remove the zinc case application since we're going to redeploy it. And you'll notice that we've added the ops dependency. So before we didn't have any requirements like TXT dependencies. Uh, so the, the pack charm we get will look a little bit different uh, because the, the dot charm file that's uploaded to charm hub includes all our dependencies packaged with the charm. Okay, if we take a look at the charm again. You'll see that it's a little different this time. Um, so it has the same hooks, SRC, everything's before, but now we have this virtual environment. Uh, this isn't exactly the same as a standard Python virtual environment, um, but it's pretty similar. And so it has all the all our Python dependencies installed. So you can see ops, and then ops also depends on PyAML. And so that's installed and packaged alongside the charm. And if we deploy it, And now if we take a look at the Juju debug log, we should see that the hello kubecon log once for the start event, but we won't see it, for example, for the install event. As you can see that we had um, the term executed and emitted this uh, here. The term executed, uh, and this is a debug message from ops saying that the install event was emitted, um, but then we don't have any warning log with the hello kubecon because our 
our callback didn't run. And then here's the leader elected event. And then config changed. And then here when we get the start event is where we get the, the hello kubecon log message. Okay, so now, um, right now, the charm is normally with a Kubernetes charm, you have the workload container with the application that you're running and the charm container uh, with our, our Python code. But right now, we just have the Python code and we're missing that workload container. So, for example, if I were to take a look at the pod, You can see that it's one of one containers. And if we look at the containers, you'll see that there's just a container for the charm and there's no container for the workload. So now we're going to add that workload. Um, so first, we need to add the container in our metadata file. Um, so we'll add. So here we're just updating the summary and description to be a little bit more clear. And then here is where we're defining the container that we want to do to deploy alongside our charm container. So we have a container called Zinc that uses the Zinc image, and we're also defining a, a file system. Uh, that will be mounted into the container. Uh, and you can see that it uses, here we define the, the storage that we're using. So file system, uh, this is, we can use file system across multiple clouds. And then in the case of Kubernetes, it will give us a persistent volume. Uh, and then that will be mounted at bar slash web slash sync search in the zinc container. Uh, and then the zinc container is using this zinc image resource which is just saying um, OCI image, and then we're using this OCI image from GitHub. Uh, this field is not used by Juju, but it's used by Charmcraft and by the integration tests. Um, so when we when we deploy a Charm, or when we release a Charm to Charm Hub, we can attach this image um, so that when someone deploys a Charm, they, they get this workload container. So let's add that. And then for the charm, um, so here we're just renaming the charm class. And then, um, so now with the, we're going to listen to a new event. Um, so Juju gives us a start event when the, the charm container is ready. Um, but in order for us to know when the workload container is ready, we have to listen to a pebble ready event. Uh, let's see. And so this is this is saying when the zinc container uh, is ready, when pebble is running in that container, then we want to to run this command or to to run this callback. Um, so here, um, and so so the way that Pebble works is it has this uh, system of layers that allows us to define what services we want to run in the container. And so here, uh, this is what that Pebble layer looks like. Uh, so we're saying we have this zinc service that runs this command. And we want it to run on startup. We want it to save the logs to this file um, and save standard out. And then we want to set these environment variables for that service. So we're setting a username, a password, and that path to the storage that we that we specified in our metadata. Uh, 
Um, and then in the handler for the Pebble Ready event, what we're doing is we're using the Ops API to get the container and to add that Pebble layer. And replan will just restart any services that we've changed. Uh, finally, we're opening the, the port uh, that Zinc uses, and we're setting the unit status uh, to active. So if we pack that, um, and if you're following along, you can get to the same code by checking out the three dash container. Uh, check out three dash container. And you can see because the Python dependencies are same, it's a much quicker to pack now. And so this is the usual experience you'll have when packing a term. Uh, and if we deploy it, oh, we have to remove the old application first. Then we can deploy it. And you'll notice that it's missing the sync image. So when we deploy from Charm Hub, Charm Hub has information about the images that we need to deploy the charm with. But when we deploy locally, we need to tell Juju manually what those images are. So we're going to specify our resource. And I'm just going to copy paste the information from our metadata file. So this is our resource name. And then the OCI image is here. And so now if we take a look at the pod, you can see that there's two containers. And if we you can see that there's the charm container that comes with every charm and the zinc container that we just defined with our container image. And you can see that the entry point for that container is Pebble. So Pebble is injected into the container. And then Pebble will manage the services to start sync as we've specified in our term. And you can see that um, this active status that we set in the unit now shows up. Um, and so now we should be able to connect to the Zinc console. Um, so give me a second to pull up the web browser. So I need to copy the IP address for the pod, and it should be port 4080. OK, and let me switch the screen sharing. And here is that operator console. So I just went to the pod IP address and then 4080. Uh, and then it redirected me to this page. And then if you remember, our, we set the username as admin and the password as password. So we can sign in. And you can see this is the, the Zinc dashboard. So uh, this password isn't very secure. And so what we're going to do next is we're going to add, we're going to define an action on our term that allows the administrator to, to change the password. Um, so let me switch back to the IDE. Um, so there's this actions.yaml file that allows us to define actions for our term. And so this is the name of the action. We're going to, so we're going to, uh, I misspoke. We're not having the admin set the password. We're going to generate a password for them. And then or, in order for them to access the Zinc dashboard, they'll run this action and the term will give them the password. Um, so this is the name of the action. And then this is a description that's shown to the operator. Uh, and it's just getting the admin password for Zinc. 
and then the the operate operator can log in with that admin password and then change the password in the zinc web interface itself So again, we have to add that to actions.yaml file. And then there's a couple changes we need to make. Um, so in our charm code, we're going to import the, sorry, We're going to import the built, Python's built-in secret library to generate that password. And then we're going to listen to a new event. And so when the operator runs that action, we'll get this get admin password action event. And this is the callback that we're going to register. And then here is just the defining, we're defining the callback. Um, we're just setting the, the result of the event. So this is what shows up to the operator. And we're telling them this is the admin password and we're using this method to generate that. Um, and so if the, the password does not exist, we're going to, to generate it using the secrets library. And then we're going to save that into a data bag. So a data bag is what Juju uses in integrations. So when you have an integration between two terms, they have a set of data bags. So you have a data bag for the application uh, and then you have a data bag for each unit. So if I were to to integrate Mattermost and Postgres, there would be a Mattermost application data bag, a Postgres application data bag. And let's say I had like three units of Postgres and two units of Mattermost, there would be two Mattermost unit data bags, one for each unit and three Postgres unit data bags, one for each unit and every unit um, a Postgres and every unit of Mattermost is able to read the information from each of those data bags. With the, the concept of data bags also applies to, uh, you can have a, a charm that has data bags that it shares with other units, and that's called a peer integration or peer relation. Um, and so this lets us, it's as if we were to, to integrate um, like Mattermost with Postgres, but we're just integrating all units of the charm together. And so the way that we do that is we add, um, uh, we can add a peer integration to our metadata.yaml. Uh, and this is, this will be automatically created by Juju. So the operator doesn't need to type Juju integrate zinc, zinc. Um, it just comes when the application is deployed. And then here we're using some features that are specific to newer versions of Juju. So we're just adding to the metadata saying that you can only use Juju 3.1. So if an operator tries to deploy this on an older version, it will let them know that it won't work. And then um, within this handler, um, so what we're doing is if the password does not exist, we're going to generate it. Um, then we're going to, to store it as a secret in Juju. Uh, this is the feature that requires Juju 3.1. So instead of storing the, the secret as plain text in our data bag, we're going to use Juju Secrets, which is a feature that lets us securely store those secrets. And then in the data bag in plain text, we will only store a reference to that secret. And then Juju will verify that when we try to access that secret, that our unit is authorized to access that secret. Um, so here um, we're adding a secret to the app and then we're accessing the relation data uh, with the ops API and setting that, that ID of the secret in the peer data bag so that if we scale this application up to other units, those other units will be able to access the secret reference and then be able to retrieve the admin password from the Juju. And so if the user runs the get admin password on another unit, 
it will be able to, to show them the admin password, even though it wasn't the unit that created it. Um, and so just going back here, what you can see is uh, it's checking that our peer relation exists. If it doesn't exist, that means the term is in a setup phase, so we're not going to generate a password for now. Um, and then if we've already generated a password, we're just going to grab it from the app data bag. Um, so here we retrieve the secret reference. Here we get the secret from Juju. And then here we're returning the value of the password, which gets displayed in the action. Uh, and then here you'll notice this is leader command. This is part of uh, ops. So Juju has a concept. Let me go back to the terminal. So when we have multiple units of an application, so if I scale up the, the Zinc operator application, the Zinc case application, excuse me, to say three units, uh, Juju will pick one of these three units to be a leader. And it adds this asterisk next to the unit name to say this unit is the leader. So you can see these other units do not have an asterisk. Um, and so Juju ensures that we'll always have one leader. And um, that leader is the only one of these units that can write to the Zinc Kate's application data bag. So each unit can write to its unit data bag, but the leader is responsible for managing the application as a whole. So it manages the integrations with other units. It manages the application data bag. Um, so here we're just checking if we're the leader. Um, so, okay, just to start over, um, if the relation doesn't exist, we return. If the secret has been generated, we use that. Otherwise, if the secret has not been generated and we're the leader, we generate the secret and store it in the data bag so that other units can access it. Otherwise, if we're not the leader, we return nothing and we wait for that secret to be generated. Um, and then one last thing is that we need to modify the pebble layer so that instead of using the password, we are using that generated password. So you can see um, we're switching from hard-coded password to the generated password. And then if you're following along and you're behind, you can check out uh, four dash action to, to catch up. Um, so here we'll pack the term. And again, so an action is the term can define as many actions as it needs to. And those are things that the operator can run. They can run juju run, and then the term can respond to that action. It can send data back to the operator. It can change something about the application, et cetera. Um, I'm also going to, okay, it's packed. And then we're going to remove the old application. And then we're going to deploy the term we just built. Oh, uh, yep. We need to specify the image. Um, and then once that once that term starts, we can run the action. So the way we do that is juju run and then the name of the unit. And then we're going to run git admin password. And you can see this is the password that was generated. And if we were to scale the application um, and run this on, say, a different unit, because we saved that into the peer application data bag, we should be able to retrieve it from another unit. And you can see that we get the same password. So I'm going to copy this password and I'm going to switch back to the browser.
Um, and then if we refresh the page, the, we did remove the application and redeploy it. So there's a new IP address. So I'm just going to copy that new IP address. And then if we try to log in with the old admin password, it doesn't work. And then let me copy the admin password. And then the generated password, that's uh, this from before. And we're signed in. Uh, so we successfully add an action to our term. And one last thing that we're going to do is you, you may have noticed that the, we didn't do this in the most secure way possible. Uh, let me switch back to the IDE. Here we go. Um, is that if the, the peer relation isn't available, we're returning an empty string for a secret. So for a brief period of a couple of seconds, we have um, we have this the secret uh, is set to nothing. Um, so instead of doing that, um, what we can do is we can use one of the, the features of the ops framework that I mentioned, which is deferring events. And so instead of, so right now, what happens when we get the zinc pebble ready event is we're saying add this layer and start the zinc service with whatever password we have, which could be this empty string. And so what we're going to do is we're going to check if that string is empty. And if it is, we're going to defer this event. Um, so what this means is that the next time um, the term is executed, this deferred event, this deferred handler will run. Um, and then if the password has been set by that point, uh, that means that the peer relation is active, then we will go ahead with adding the layer and starting the service. Um, so we can pack this. Uh, and one more tool that you might find useful um, is, OK, we'll remove this first. Uh, Jhack has a tool that, so like you can see the, the events that are fired in the debug log. Um, but sometimes it's like a little hard to read with the other, I have to wait for that, okay. with the other messages in the debug log. So there's a Jhack tool called Jhack tail which gives us a nice visualization of which events have been fired. So if we take a look at this, we can see um, this was from when we just removed those last applications that the, the remove and the stop event were fired um, on the Zinc units. You can see now on this new Zinc Kids unit, we get the install event, Zinc peer relation change event, leader elected, Zinc bubble ready. And so this lets you visualize what's happening and what the term is running. And it will show you across all the different units. Um, and there's a lot of other helpful tools like this with Jhack that are great for term developers. Uh, and so you can see that we're active. And then let's run the git admin password uh, one more time. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a new password that's generated because it's a new deployment of the term. And then this new IP address is a new password. And then if we switch back to the browser one last time. And then we go to the new IP address. Oops. And I copy paste that password.
and we're all set. Um, and that's it for this workshop. Uh, so just to recap, what you did is you wrote your first term, uh, then we implemented the action. We learned about ops um, and how Juju works under the hood, how to add a container to our term. And then finally, we learned about deferring events. Uh, if you have any questions, um, we encourage you to reach out either in the chat now or if you have any questions later, please, please reach out to us and join our community on the Mattermost and on the forms. Uh, we're happy to help you write your first term and get started. Um, and I hope you, you learned something from this workshop and you're ready to get charming and write your first termed application. Thank you. My name is Michael Jäger, and I would like to talk today about how to how to join the ecosystem, how to publish a charm. So you have a charm, and you would like to make it available for others. You would like to publish it. So let's look back on what we have seen today. In many sessions, the charm was just sitting in the local file system and has been taken from there, which is certainly fine and necessary for development. But at the same time, you're wondering what would be the best way of providing that software for others. Well, I mean, what you see many times is, for example, you can take a certain state on, on, on your repository on GitHub and then make this tag a release and write release notes and put some artifacts at the bottom. Or maybe you have download pages if you provide also software on your own where users can download the software. But in fact, let's face it, that's super antique, right? That has happened 10 years ago. No one is manually downloading software from web pages and is installing them locally in, in their file system. What, what the way you distribute software today is, is about package management, right? You would like to, to have integrated tooling, which takes over downloading all the required artifacts from some central location, and then do whatever you would like to, to do um, on your computers, on the machines, um, where you intend to use the software. And when, when it comes to publishing software and package management, you wonder like where to go. Um, it's actually where the community is. You would like to go where the crowd is, right? And as such, we also provide a place for Juju, for the charms with Juju, which is charmhub.io. Charmhub.io is not just a website. It's a website where you can see the available charms and you can browse them and find more information about them. But more importantly, it's the sort of package management for the charms that others have written and hopefully also for your charm. Juju is integrated with charmhub.io. And in parallel to using charms from the local file system, Juju can download the charm and required artifacts from that server. So charmhub.io, first of all, comes with a number of advantages that many package management systems have. Let's reflect a little bit on these. One thing, obviously, is that you have access to most of the ecosystem in one place. Think about package managers for different platforms, for different programming languages, and so on. You would say like, yeah, most of the ecosystem is actually available there. And that has multiple advantages, including that you minimize duplicates. Because it becomes apparent if the software with the same purpose is already there, right? And, and making a duplicate becomes more a conscious decision if existing software is actually very transparently displayed. Obviously, which I mentioned, there is the technical integration. Juju interacts with CharmHub as other package management client uh, integrate with a package management server. But more importantly, um, if you consider package management with web pages, uh, because there are also package management servers without web pages, but if you have a web page that describes the software, which um, provides useful information about the software, and even rating stars, um, usage testimonials, reviews, and whatever, quality becomes a little bit more transparent. Right? So quality is a very important point when it comes to Juju and Charms, especially because most of the software runs in the applications. We have some guidelines when we think about quality for Charms, um, some, and I would call them higher level ideas about quality. One higher level idea for quality is that we actually provide open source charms. We think that open source is required because 
users would like to have transparency about what is running on their servers. Well, to some extent, of course, open source is easily implemented if you provide software in Python. But at the same time, open source software is also presenting software in the public in an open source way, not just that the user, the consumer of the software has only access to the source code because that's the way of, of how uh, software for Python is distributed. At the same time, open source means also distributed collaboration. And we believe also that open source is not only important for the transparency provided, but it allows for experts, it allows experts for coming together and collaborate on a charm, which is very important, especially when it comes to the operation of applications, for example, the operation of database servers. Obviously, an important quality guideline is testing. And um, I, will, I will tell you more about this in a few slides. And it's about consistency. It's about making your contributions consistent with other contributions. And that is also what you would like to achieve, especially with Charm Hub. Let me tell you more about the consistency about your contributions with respect to existing contributions. So if you think about the charms, and if you think about an ecosystem of charms, you quickly realize the idea that some of the charmed applications are building blocks reused in many scenarios. Many web applications will use a database server. And if you think about the need of the web application to integrate with the database server, then this is obviously something which, which, which is being repeated in many cases, but with different applications, right? The integration capabilities of Juju and the Charm SDK allow for reuse of integration facilities between different applications. So if you imagine different web servers that utilize the same database server, all of them just need to implement one way of integrating with the database server rather than having this n, n m kind of complexity of integrating applications with each other. You can see that if you, for example, as shown here on the screenshot with the Charm PostgreSQL, um, how many applications actually use the integration provided by Juju and Charms for that database server? And that is a huge advantage when it comes to the ecosystem. Reusing integrations and telling applications for another application, we have just one way of integrating with it, saves a lot of development time and gives you also consistency during operations. So far, so good. Um, but you might wonder, that's that's actually quite 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 nice on the concept. How does it look like in reality? What's what's the technical implementation of publishing a charm, right? So we have the tool Charmcraft. You have seen the Charmcraft tool today in the demo, for example, by Carl for building packaging a charm. But Charmcraft is also used for uploading the charm to Charm Hub, and the commands are very straightforward as you see them here on the slide. You first start with a login. The login is created on our tool launchpad. I think people from the from from the Ubuntu ecosystem universe um, know launchpad quite well. So all you, that what you would need is to create an account as a developer, so to say, on launchpad, and then you use that account with Charmcraft to log in. You create a session. We just don't want to to allow people to to unauthenticatedly upload stuff to, to the Charm Hub, right? You create a session with your Launchpad account, rather. Then you check if the name is available that you intend for your Charm. You use Charm Craft Register and then your Charm name. And if that's successful, then you can upload your Charm and, and maybe resources for it. And after you have successfully uploaded all the things, then you tell Charm Hub IO what release you have just provided. We have the idea of different channels when providing software. So it could be the better channel, it could be stable, it could be candidate and, and all these things, because we believe that in software development, you have developers and end users and testers and all these things, and you would like to provide them with individual releases going step by step. After all of this, the charm should be available under the given URL. So that was pretty straightforward, I guess. Um, at the same time, you might wonder, OK, that's that's good in terms of concepts. That's that's maybe good in terms of technical implementation, very straightforward. At the same time, how do I know how 
I mean, how I use, I know, right? But how do I know a, a more about the qualities of a charm, about the capabilities of a charm? And that's actually the point. We think about charms in terms of the qualities they provide and the capability capabilities they provide. So about software quality, um, it, it's basically an own research topic and, and many frameworks have, have been defined that they find software quality concepts for software. For us, it's very simple. First of all, make it useful for others. And that has actually two stages. Make it useful for others to contribute, to participate in the development. That basically boils down to standard practices and open source software development. And at the same time, you need to ensure reliability, stability, and all these things um, in order to make it useful for the use in the back end of organizations, right? And at the same time, increasing the quality, increasing the usefulness has for us all, for all of us, the motivation to, to push the ecosystem towards a single implementation um, for, for a charm for a workload, right? So basically, we don't want to see five different charms for the same database server. We find that maybe there could be reasons, but in essence, it would be more, much more useful to provide one database implementation where different experts come together and collaborate on its development. About, about the capabilities, it's very important not to forget that it's not about the installation only. I mean, um, the installation alone is already very capable if you think about what Juju can do for you. Juju remote installs all your stuff on all the different Kubernetes clusters that you might have out there, right? So it's it's basically, it, in the beginning, it's a remote install tool, but that doesn't cover operations at all. So capabilities must be about operations when it comes to the development of a chart. But let's maybe talk about qualities first and we have defined qualities in a maturity model for charms. So you see here the URL. You can access this also with a barcode. And there are basically four different qualities for a charm that we find important. Of course, it needs to be reliable. It needs to be ready for collaboration, useful, approachable. It needs to be compliant. I didn't talk about this so far. But if you think about the situation that charms are a separate piece of software than the workload. And what can happen is that they are also developed by a separate organization than the organization or the community that develops the workload. And especially for charms in this constellation, it's very important to respect the trademarks and IPs of others. So charms need to be compliant as well. And charms need to be up to date. And let me tell you a little bit of um, background consideration about charms, why these qualities are so important. Charms are special. Charms are different than many other software that we all consume. If you think about software that you consume on your devices, on your smartphone, you download it, you test it. If you don't like it, you throw it away. For charms, since they are made for a distributed systems environment, it's a little bit more complicated because in order to try them, in order to find out how it works for you, you need to provide a distributed system, right? You need to provide Kubernetes somehow. Um, since many charms are integrated or many workloads covered by charms are integrated with each other, you, you probably need to first install different other applications because before you can before you can actually test the charm that you would like to test or evaluate or whatever. So setting up an environment to get started with a charm that you would like to use can take some time. It can mean to set up a distributed systems environment, whatever this is, all supported by Juju, and therefore, it's much more frustrating if you think about collaborating, if you think about becoming winning developers, becoming a larger community, if your charm doesn't work very well. And there is a second thing where up-to-dateness actually plays an important role. If you think about charms, they basically need to consider not only the review cycle of the charm itself, right? The charm is a piece of software. You develop new features. You 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 create new releases, that's all fine. But importantly, the charm covers a workload and that workload also has its own release cycle, right? So whenever the workload comes out with a new release, which maybe has some new functionality or a different way of, of covering operations of that workload, you need to adapt the charm and make a new release maybe in the charm as well. And charms are written for Juju 
and using the Charm SDK. So whenever Juju and Charm SDKs provide new features, you also may want to provide a new release for your Charm. And last but not least, somewhere you need to run your workloads and your Charms. And that somewhere might be, for example, Kubernetes. And also this space provides updates, right? Many of the past Kubernetes releases have provided new APIs, new features that you would like maybe also to support that may imply changes also to your operations code that you that you actually provide with your charm. So if you consider the charm as a special kind of software, it becomes obvious that reliability is more important than ever, not just only to have a reliable server, not just important for providing a reliable service, but also important in terms of it covers a lot of different release cycles in that distributed systems environment, and therefore also the up-to-dateness, the ability to provide new releases, um, the, uh, the, the ability to maintain the charm very well is very important for charms. And of course, let's not keep this like nice guidelines and great ideas. For charms, we have also provided extensive documentation on how to test charms um, there are testing tools also available. And if you would like to see how we find that testing charms has been done quite well, um, you will find here the links of two charms where you could look into how the testing was implemented and how the automation of the testing was implemented. At the same time, when it comes to up-to-dateness, we ask you to think about automation for creating releases. It's, it's the reason why we have the different channels. No one asks to continuously make new final releases to the end users, but con being able to continuously release in an automated way whenever the master updates is also not a new idea. Nightly builds, for example. For charms, you need to automate that, that kind of methodology. And there are GitHub actions also for that using the charm, charm craft tooling, right? So here on this barcode and uh, on the links, you will find example implementations for automating the release product process um, for, for your charm development. So far, so good. These are things for ensuring that the charm will be useful for others. But as said, there is a more important thing to come. And this is not just covering opera uh, installation. It's about covering operations, right? It's about not just having this the software being rolled out. Um, Juju does a quite remarkable job on this with the abstraction of all the different cloud substrates that Juju provides even beyond Kubernetes. Um, Juju also integrates with virtual machine landscapes and, and all these things and can integrate applications also between uh, those running on virtual machines and those running on Kubernetes. But at the same time, it's about operations. It's about the, the experience after you have installed the workload using the charms. One important thing that becomes apparent first after you have installed it, is it ready to go? If the application permits, it should be ready to go in terms of settings and defaults applied for this application. Of course, no one can foresee intended use cases of all potential users, right? But it should be what we call sensible defaults. Useful defaults that let you, um, that provide the application with you in, in a kind of useful state. Um, that is, that is obviously only possible if the if if some initial configuration is not required, right? If you have something like a rewrite proxy, obviously you need to provide a rewrite rule in order to have it um, to have it working. Um, but for the cases where sensible default makes sense, there should be sensible default. On the technical side, on the capability, there should be compatibility with the ecosystem. It's a sort of cohesiveness which I have already outlined before why it's useful to, to look at the available charms, to look at available integrations and join that ecosystem, not only of applications, but also of integrations between the applications. If we come to real day two task or day end task, then it's about upgrading, obviously. The charm should support upgrade of the workloads. It should be tested, it should be covered, and users of the charm for operating the application should be able to rely on that upgrades work. We have seen in some of the presentations that some of the workloads were started already with, with multiple instances. And 
an obvious operational task is scaling up and scaling down for a number of reasons to provide more reliability to distribute the load or um, um, to, to in, in the case of scaling down, to save on cost on, on, on consumed resources. Charms should cover the correct um, scaling up and scaling down of the workload as intended by the workload. Because if you even think about databases, databases, database servers, um, they often implement a special way of scaling up, scaling down, or implementing a high availability setup, and so on and so forth. A very fundamental task when operating applications is obviously backup and the capability to restore also the backup from the backup. And that is something which should be covered by a charm as well. All of these things are defined also in the maturity model, which is referenced down here and can be accessed also by scanning the QR code. So this is maybe a useful next step, but some of you might wonder, okay, great, but how, how do we know if a charm actually provides all these qualities and capabilities, right? We have defined a review process, which is truly open source. It provides the transparency from the beginning to the end. And we do this by asking everyone who'd like to provide their charm for review by doing a structured post on Discourse, the community, under a special topic, which is called review request. So everyone can see that someone has submitted a charm for review. And accordingly, the discussion and also the verdict of the review will be there transparently and accessible for everyone. Obviously, not just providing the post and discussing it uh, is required, but both the entity, the person who submits the charm for review and the persons who review the charm need review guidelines that you will also find there in the description of the review process. But most importantly, in addition to the transparency, by putting everything on Discourse Charm Hub IO, is also the ability that for everyone, uh, that everyone can actually engage in the discussion, in the review. For some charms, it's even necessary because particular knowledge about the workload is required. So one reviewer might be, might be an expert in writing charms, and one reviewer might be an expert in the application covered by that charm, right? And the idea of making it a request on discourse makes it and makes it absolutely possible for everyone to write comments on on that review right so the discussion in the forum for us is a very very natural way of discussing these things and of course we like open source tooling so we ask um we ask persons who would like to submit a charm for review to create also a review pull request everything is described in this in this process so by this we have all these things together, right? We have a platform where the ecosystem sits, where the charms are available. It's technically integrated with Juju. We have also the expert community on discourse. We have defined criteria for the maturity of a charm. So everyone understands what by our, by our idea um, is required for providing a useful and capable charm for the use in, in many organizations, in many cases. And we have defined the review process, defining expectations, and how to look at charms to decide if these charms are really ready. So I hope you found my presentation helpful. Please feel free to ask questions also in the chat. Also later, um, you could use also discourse for asking questions about the review process or engage in the chat on the other channels that you see on MetaMost. Um, regarding the topics about charming, about juju, about particular charms, and so on.